this is a, a rapid, a rapid run through of the history of the Sidvale Association, which I, I found extremely interesting to um, look at the old records. We're very lucky, very lucky that we have the original handwritten minutes um, going right back um, to 1846, which is extraordinary, really. And in 1846, um, the very first iteration, if you like, of the um, of what we are now was called the Sidmouth Improvement Committee. Uh, in 1904, it became the Sid Vale Improvement Association, and and then in 19 that probably 1910 actually rather than 1909, the Sid Vale Association. The beginning therefore was in September 1846 when Sir John Kenaway, who you can see his photograph on the right, um, chaired a town meeting in the town hall in Sidmouth. It's interesting that he was chosen to chair it. He li lived of course in Escot rather than in Sidmouth in itself. Most of us know Sir John Kenaway as the bearded man who was in fact um, the third part this John Kenway was the second bard, uh, and his meeting uh, was to prepare for a further meeting, if you like. Um, the discussion was quite short. They decided that the town was in need of improvement. The italics are mine there. Uh, greater accommodation for visitors. Now come back to that as to what they meant by accommodate, accommodation and to secure walks on the cliffs and Sulcum Hill. And so the proposal was that there should be a Sidmouth Improvement Committee. And two days later, that committee uh, convened. And this is the important one of which we have all the handwritten uh, um, minutes. John Carslake, who was known in the town very well, uh, he was then, um, I think round about 60, he'd been, a uh, heroic figure in the Napoleonic Wars because he'd been at the Battle of Trafalgar on HMS Victory as a midshipman. He'd had a rather difficult life subsequently, been a prisoner of war under the French. And I, I, one gets the impression that his life hadn't been entirely easy, but he was known to many people in the town and he was the first chair. Now, all the italics I've put there are my own because uh, I, I need to explain them. It was felt that the committee should improve the walk on the beach. The walk was what we would now call the esplanade. Uh, also that there should be good order on all public promenades, which means in fact, all the walking areas, that there should be better seats or chairs. And this is interesting. This meant better seats or chairs on the front. And this is what was meant by accommodation, strangely enough. The 19th century meaning of accommodation wasn't just lodging houses, but also appliances, which is rather odd. And then there were two very ambitious uh, aims of the committee. One was to secure paths, not only uh, in Sidmouth, but in adjoining parishes, which of course isn't easy. Uh, uh, and the last one was proper drainage and sewerage in the town. This, of course, was the days before uh, a town council. They decided um, that they needed a quorum of five before any meeting could be held, which turned out to be a bit tricky because towards the end of the 19th century, it became difficult sometimes for five people to form a meeting. Uh, of the 27 members at the beginning, all predictably were men. Um, and uh, I, whether it was open to women or not, I, I don't know, it's not stated. And it's curious, there was one Bart, of course, that was um, Kenaway, uh, the, a knight, nine esquires and 17 misters. Somebody may be able to help me distinguish between an esquire and a mister. My understanding is that an esquire is somebody who has inherited property or more importantly land and probably doesn't do too much for a living, whereas the misters are the people that do the hard work, but perhaps I'm just being cynical. 
very briefly to say something about the chairs on the beach. They got on with this immediately and they had chairs made. These were bespoke chairs um, uh, made and uh, they put them on the what we would now call the esplanade. And in the next meeting, after the chairs had been made, there was indignation by the committee that the chairs were occupied by sailors and low people. And um, uh, I guess that if you put chairs out, you can't really uh, decide who's going to sit in them. And so they, they passed an in interesting, um, well, they had a discussion and decided they should put five inexpensive seats under the seawall outside the esplanade uh, and hoped that sailors and low people would sit there. Um, we aren't told what happened after that. Another difficulty they had, which was in, in some ways almost as amusing as that one, was concerned with Salcom Lawn, which is that area of ground as you first get into the buys from the toll house end, um, adjacent and close to um, what is now Hunter's Moon Hotel and was then called Salcom House. And it was clear that the style was in a state of disrepair uh, and it was difficult actually to get into uh, what we now call the buys. And uh, furthermore, the footpath, which was accessible to the public, was in a very poor state of repair. Now we've got this beautiful um, idolized print that you can see, which was painted by Hasler in 1816. So this is some 30 years before. Uh, it may be that it was better 30 years before, but I rather doubt it. I think this was a rather uh, artistic version of what it looked like. But the Improvement Committee decided that they needed a wicket gate rather than a style and that the uh, footpath should be repaired. And this is where there were difficulties almost immediately. Uh, the first difficulty was who owned the land? Dean um, Coburn, who uh, uh, occupied what was Salcom House, now Hunter's Moon Hotel, um, thought the land was his, whereas the um, Charles Cornish, uh, who was Lord of the Manor of Salcom Regis, um, said that the land actually was his. And indeed, he felt that the house belonged to him as well, which is extraordinary. There seemed to be some uh, argument about the title of the house. And furthermore, it said in the committee meeting that uh, Charles Cornish was averse to all improvement, <laughs> which is a bit tricky. But nevertheless, he did change his mind eventually and allowed for a gate to be put in into the um, uh, uh, into Salcombe Lawn from, from the toll house uh, and also for the footpath to be repaired. And it's interesting that footpaths are an important, a very important part of the uh, improvement committee right from the start. And indeed, the achievements were considerable of the improvement committee. And I hope you can read these, but if not, I'll read them out to you. Uh, these were in the first 20 years or so, um, up to about the 1860s, 1870s. They uh, put together uh, the argument and the financing uh, of the first Alma Bridge, which we'll go to in the next slide. They rented the Fort Field, which was very important, and they rented it for recreation, but especially for cricket. And there's a very charming photograph there, which looks to be about 1870s, I think. Uh, if you haven't seen it before, it's the most interesting photograph. The building that you can see straight opposite became, and it might have been then, but became the Torbay Hotel and is now the Aberfield um, uh, um, uh, uh, building. And uh, cricket is being played in a rather ad hoc way on the Ford Field. And you can probably see if you've got good eyesight that a black Labrador is fielding at square mm -hmm. leg. Um, the first Jacob's Ladder also was an achievement and it really was a ladder. And you can see from the Hutchinson watercolor that this was a straight up and down ladder, which turned out not to be fit for purpose. But nevertheless, um, they it provided for athletic people anyway, access uh, to the Western Beach. They did achieve their aim of footpaths to the very top of Salcombe Hill. 
as well as footpaths through the byes, and they planted trees, particularly, they stated, on the Sulcombe side of the Sid. So these were a number of important achievements. Here is a watercolour, uh, sorry, an oil painting rather, uh, in 1855 uh, of the um, um, first Alma Bridge. And uh, it wasn't a terribly substantial structure, but nevertheless, it was an achievement to produce a route uh, uh, into and uh, joining paths in Sulcum Regis. Even this was opposed. This was opposed not by the Lord of the Manor who had in the subsequent years died, Charles Cornish, but his wife followed in her husband's temperament by objecting to the bridge. And it took quite a lot of time before she could be persuaded that the bridge was a good thing and should be allowed to happen. And uh, the bridge uh, was satisfactory, but consecutive storms eventually produced uh, um, a lot of damage. And the 1902 replacement Sampson design bridge was the initiative, I don't think, of the Improvement Committee, but more the initiative of the uh, District Urban Council. And uh, if you can see in the uh, right on the far right side, uh, there has been, now that that bridge itself has been demolished, there has been a memorial to it, which has been put together by both the Samson Society and the Sid Bell Association. And this is a good example of voluntary organizations working together. And I think it's a most attractive memorial. Right from the start and right up to the present time, the River Sid has featured prominently as far as the association is concerned. And in 1906, I, uh, I found this handwritten uh, comment by Ellis Selleck. Now, uh, I'd, I'd very much like, if anybody knows, a photo, if we can have a photograph of Mr. Selleck, I'd very much appreciate it. I have a very poor quality one, but um, it'd be interesting to see what he looked like. He was an ironmonger and his premises was part of what is now Potbury's. And he worked tremendously hard for the improvement committee, tremendously hard. Uh, sometimes it, my impression is that he was working on his own. And he wrote this in 1906, you may not be able to read it, but it reads, among the many things which could be done to improve Sid Vale, there is not one of more importance than the preservation of the beautiful walk along the banks of the Sid itself and the fishery, which is such a source of attraction to young and old. And so that was written at the beginning of the 20th century. In 1911, uh, an actual... Uh, Sid Vale Association pamphlet was published by a Cornish, a, a different Cornish, this is the Reverend J.G. Cornish, which is a very interesting document uh, about his love of the River Sid, and he updated it in 1933. And in 1992, the senior river warden, Bernard Myers, wrote a really brilliant um, pamphlet uh, about the River Sid. Uh, unfortunately, it's no longer available and copies are really quite valuable now. I spoke to Bernard um, several days ago, he's 92 now, and um, he remembers um, writing it. And what was interesting is that when he wrote it as the senior river warden, there were four other river wardens working with him. So the river has been extremely important throughout the history of the association. Uh, and a more up-to-date photograph on the right side. A lot of people have put a lot of work into it, volunteers. The defining meeting was in 1910. Um, it has been previously written as 1909, but that was a mistake in the minutes itself. They got the year mixed up. I only discovered that yesterday when I was looking through it. It's 1910, February the 27th. At that stage, 
the Sidvale Improvement Committee had already become the Sidvale Improvement Association and Annie Lee Brown was uh, on the committee. She was a nationally known figure, a suffragist, uh, a journalist, a writer, an educationalist. Uh, she was very, very familiar with how committees worked. And what's interesting in looking at the handwritten minutes is the amount of proposals that she made. I've simply photographed three that she did in rapid succession on February the 27th that year. And the second one, Miss Lee Brown proposed that in future the association be called the Sidvale Association. This was seconded by Miss Dutton and Carrie. So there you are. That's when it became um, the SPA. And Annie Lee Brown, it seems to me and to others, was an extremely important member of the Sidvale Association. And it's thanks to her that the buys and the banks of the River Sid have been cleaned up uh, and um, preserved and protected. There's a photograph on the left there of how the buys were, and uh, there were a number of um, number of things that can be seen from this, but the most important thing is the very poor state of the banks. And more importantly, uh, um, uh, the obstructions that happened uh, every so often as you were walking, as you were walking down a public footpath as it was then, there were obstructions because of people's properties and gardens that extended right down to the river itself. And th this may be an orchard, or it may be um, a pen for keeping hens, but it meant that these had to be negotiated or were often in a filthy condition. And it's thanks, uh, I, think, I think almost entirely to the Sidvale Association, uh, rather than the council then, uh, and more specifically to Annie Lee Brown, who bought uh, a number of acres of the buyers that the beautiful area of parkland is as it is now. And footpaths, uh, you remember, I mentioned that in 1846, this has remained very, very prominent as well. And uh, we're dealing with 39 miles of footpaths, 20 miles of bridleways. Uh, we have wardens uh, that look at the paths uh, throughout the year and also help with clearing and cleaning. So that remains very important. And another combined approach the Sidvale Association has made was with the um, town council, I think um, three years ago, to produce this 13 mile walking route around uh, the Sid Valley, the Sid Valley Ring, which uh, is very interesting and worthwhile and a great achievement. I mentioned earlier um, about land. This is interesting. You may know already already know this that, that are watching, but land was um, fairly re it's been a fairly recent uh, achievement for the Sidvale Association. I think the very first purchase. I may be wrong, but I think the per first purchase was uh, in uh, 1977, and that was almost 20 acres. The uh, Soldiers Hill Field. Uh, which is quite a complex um, uh, three plots all together, and then subsequent uh, purchases of land uh, right up to right up to um, 2019, the NAP, which is very recently two years ago, and that's eight acres. And I think this comes to just over 50 acres. I think our website says just over 40 acres, but unless my maths is wrong, I made it to just over 50 acres which is a considerable amount and of course quite a lot of it is concerned with uh, natural history. The only physical location really is the trope pump, uh, which I understand with a little bit of persuasion still works and has to be maintained. So photographs that you're all familiar with, the Golden Cops in uh, Margaret's Meadow and Gilchrist Field just adjacent to it, the map, which is the most recent acquisition. And Ed mentioned that the Cornish fields are leased to a farmer um, who harvests it once a year. Going, moving on to conservation. Conservation has been important 
um, certainly, um, I think really from the start, really from the start, and indeed talks on town planning were given um, in the Victorian period and certainly early in the 20th century as well. I think you will all remember the background to the photograph on the left. You may even recognize uh, some of the figures there. And uh, that was important in bringing a lot of people of like mind together uh, with an uh, interesting walk along the front. And on the right, if you can see it, is the gate into the byes um, by the toll house. And the gate itself has a history uh, of conservation. It probably dates not from the original toll house of 1817, but probably dates from the 1840s. But it came close to being um, salvaged uh, and melted down in the Second World War. But a member of the Sidvale Association took the gate and hid it. It's not an easy thing to hide. I'm not quite sure where he or she hid it, and then replaced it in 1946. Uh, or soon after the Second World War. So that was uh, a valuable piece of uh, rescue. And unfortunately, the toll house is in a state of disrepair. You can see it there. And a function of the SVA is to draw this listed, well, to draw the, the, the attention of this important, very important and beautiful listed building to the uh, attention of the EDDC. Uh, Richard Thurlow uh, did this on three occasions and nothing has happened uh, and I've written again myself um, and have been told that something is going to happen but it will need quite a lot of um, further pressure I think. Only one slide on the museum, it's such a huge subject in itself. Now of course a museum wasn't thought of in the 1840s but it was considered um, certainly from the time of Annie Lee Brown owning uh, Wilcombe House and she did in fact have exhibitions on the first floor uh, of Wilcombe House in the 1920s and 1930s and it was used for SVA lectures as well and after her death her partner Mary Kilgore inherited the property for her lifetime as it were and in 1950 readily gave it to um, the town council on condition that it became a museum and the chairman uh, of the SVA, Arthur Chandler, also became the first curator of Wilcombe House Museum and it remained the museum until 1970 when it moved into Hope Cottage, but I guess most of you uh, knew this. And very briefly, um, the other activities of the Sid Vale Association. The museum walk started as long ago as 1982. Don Roberts um, started them. He called them strolls rather than walks, so he didn't put people off. Um, I don't know when the geology walk started, but probably in the last 15 years, I think, uh, or possibly from the time of Bob Symes, perhaps longer then, and the tree walks uh, have started even more recently, but have been very successful. And again, this is a combination of the Sid Vell Association and the Sidmouth Arboretum. So I think it's great when two organizations of volunteers come together like this. And the photo on the right shows you somebody being very boring and talking to people on the front and trying to avoid the seagulls. In addition, of the countryside walks, I'm pleased to say, have restarted after a, a short gap which is good news. Um, uh, I don't know the precise date when the SVA excursion started, but they are continuing. Uh, there has been a gap, of course, because of COVID, but they are restarting. And the Sidwell Association History Group started almost 10 years ago. The blue plaques be important as part of the organizational um, achievements. This came about in 1992 uh, with 32 locations and as recently as 2019 this was doubled to 64 locations and in addition to the attractive new 
Luplex, we have both a, a, a comprehensive guide to them and a, a short guide that can be carried in the pocket. Talks have been important for the Sidvale Improvement Committee and the Sidvale Association from the earliest times. And looking at the subject, subject matter of the talks, they have included the River Sid and town planning. Town planning from certainly from as early as about 1900, which is interesting. More recently, there have been Zoom talks, and I just showed these posters to show the variety of natural history, art, trees, cinemas and theatre, coast. The magazine has already been mentioned and is a really important way of keeping in contact with our members. Uh, a more recent copy of the magazine on the right, um, which shows you uh, a collection that's actually in the museum. And the one on the left, I put up because it's the 150th anniversary of the SVA magazine. So it was an important magazine. Only one minute to talk about the Keith Owen Fund, but the Keith Owen Fund changed the, the, um, changed the whole outlook of the Sidvale Association when Keith Owen made this bequest of over £2 million in 2007. I think both um, Handel Bennett and Neil Stadden, who spoke to him at the time, thought that they were going to receive a bequest of about £10,000. They didn't think it would be over £2 million. And of course, it came with a huge amount of responsibility in the administration uh, of uh, a Keith Owen Fund Committee and the awarding of grants. So a really important part of the organization now. Just coming to a conclusion, the some old publications and with recommendations, if you ever come across them to get a copy, the ones that are still available are the short Peter Orlando Hutchinson description of his life which we are still selling in the museum and is worthwhile. And also, if you don't have a copy, the Reg Lane Old Sidmouth, which is old photographs, is really first class. We do have um, a number of copies of that. And I looked online this morning and I see that um, the charge is only 4 99 so it is really cheap. You can see these other um, small books that have been published in the past if you ever see at a car boot sale or a second-hand bookshop, the C. Sidmouth one, Three Town Walks, it's worth getting. The architectural um, detail is very well done. And of course, um, since John Dahl joined us, there's been a huge increase um, in both the number of publications and indeed in their quality. Uh, I think, I think, although I'm slightly biased, probably the finest uh, publications of the museum in Devon, I would say. And here are just a few of them, including the Sidmouth's prints, which is the most recent one, the, the variation, variety of the walks, natural history, lace, Samson Sidmouth. And so that's a very, very rapid run through, but we hope that you can join us for an exhibition in Kennaway House, which is on September the 11th and 12th. And thank you very much.